Justice Sinclair, the, you have 94 recommendations that uh, cover everything from funding for the CBC to changes to the criminal code. I'm wondering what, if you can explain your thinking in the, the scope of the recommendations and whether you considered uh, scaling it back to make it more digestible for a government because I know uh, the current government may well have to throw up its hands when it looks at this, this long, lengthy list. You have to remember that we are writing for the future, not just for this government. Our view is... Well, we knew it was coming. Today, Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission released its massive report. Truth and Reconciliation about what? About Aboriginal affairs, especially residential schools in decades past. We knew it was coming for a few reasons. First of all, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Indeed, Beverly McLaughlin, came out and said language. that she believes Canada committed cultural genocide against Aboriginals. It's a shocking statement for a politician to make, let alone a sitting judge condemning Canada with a word typically used for the Nazis or the Turkish genocide in Armenia. Then we saw Justice Sinclair, who is leading this Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, tell the Toronto Star that he believed it should be against the law to criticize his views on Truth and Reconciliation and, and uh, Residential Schools. So we knew something was coming when the Chief Justice preempted things and said, yes, Canada is guilty of cultural genocide. And when Justice Murray Sinclair said it should be against the law to disagree with what he was about to say. Well, here's what he's, he finally said today. Let me take you through this report. It was hundreds of pages. I've skimmed it and read the key parts. Not every footnote, I'll try and get to it. But there's so much that I found just at a quick read that I find not just deeply disturbing, but terrifying of how it's being received so far. For example, Justin Trudeau, the leader of the Liberal Party, already announced that he is accepting the recommendations unwaveringly. That's the word he used. I don't think he's read the whole thing. It's 360 pages long, but he's already approved it. I, think, I see a lot of politically correct journalists cheering for it also. It's almost like whether or not you agree with the report is a test of how politically correct you are, like if you're wearing the right color lapel pin. I don't think most people have read it because there's some shocking things in it. Let me start with the very first words in the report and tell me what you think of this. This is just a very, I just started reading in the beginning and here's what it said. For over a century, the central goals of Canada's Aboriginal policy were to eliminate Aboriginal governments, ignore Aboriginal rights, terminate the treaties, and through a process of assimilation, cause Aboriginal peoples to cease to exist as distinct legal, social, cultural, religious, and racial entities in Canada. The establishment and operation of residential schools were a central element of this policy, which can best be described as cultural genocide. So there it is. That is the summary of the 360 pages to follow. It's no coincidence that that was the exact phrase used by Beverly McLaughlin. Except it's so obviously false. Was it really the central policy to eliminate Indians and to destroy treaties and terminate them and destroy Aboriginals? I don't think so. In fact, we have something on the books to this day called the Indian Act that perpetuates the racial divide that ghettoizes Indians. In terms of treaties, we're signing ever more. Under Stephen Harper, dozens of treaties have been signed, paying out hundreds of millions of dollars. There's been the creation of new independent First Nations like the Niska Nation. To say that the central policy has been to destroy Indians it just doesn't make any sense in the face of the fact that the Indian Act itself perpetuates. But this is all about, uh, I believe, setting a new racialization of politics. And the 360 pages to follow uh, outline that. I, uh, let me tell you what is in here and what isn't, and then I'll go through some specific sections. I was looking for a repeal of that racist Indian Act. As you know, I find the Indian Act odious. First of all, it divides us based on race. Uh, it forces us to uh, deal with each other based on different rights or privileges or obligations based on our genetics, on our race. That's just, that's just racism. And it obviously holds back Aboriginal people economically, socially. It, it is an infantilizing law. It's a condescending law that implies Aboriginal people can't handle themselves, can't do commerce, can't be trusted for themselves. They need government there as their babysitter. The trouble is that Indian Act system, that reserve system, it actually has an, it, where once they were white 
Indian agents, now there's a whole class of aboriginal lawyers, bureaucrats, activists, millionaire chiefs who have come in and actually made a profit personally and uh, created a whole industry called the Indian industry. Lawyers, bureaucrats, the people behind this report. And I note that far from wanting to repeal the Indian Act and have a true reconciliation, they want to expand the kind of racialization of Canada that the Indian Act so improperly does. You'll notice there's a lot of law talk and bureaucracies that are set up under these proposals, but not a lot of talk about job creation, economic development. And, and I find that quite notable, that this is clearly a project to serve the lawyers and bureaucrats who drafted it, not grassroots Indians. Let me prove it to you now. I, I started going through the recommendations. There, there's, there's almost a hundred of them. And I just started going through the recommendations, and recommendation number six, so this is the sixth most important thing that this Truth and Reconciliation Commission proposes, is to ban spanking. What? what? That, that's, that's in your top ten? That's in your top hundred Aboriginal issues? Yeah. To repeal section 43 of the Criminal Code, which permits spanking. That's, that's not a real issue. That's not an Aboriginal issue. You go to any reserve in this country and you ask any 10 families, do you think we should ban spanking? They'd say, are you crazy? <laughs> Yet that was proposal number six, priority number six for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. What gives? Well, it shows that this is by lawyers for lawyers. This isn't about on-reserve Indians. This isn't about real Indians trying to make a go of it. This is about weird legal... You know, flights of fancy. I mean, don't you think that's strange that that's in here? And number six, uh, there are some things in here that are hard to disagree with. For example, that there be parity between funding of education for Aboriginal children and white children. I completely agree with that, of course. And in fact, my investigations, according to the, the books published, the, uh, the finances published by the Indian uh, uh, Department of Indian Affairs and other sources of funds, show that typically... Indian schools receive, on-reserve schools receive more funding per pupil than off-reserve schools. But I'm all for parity and I'm all for publishing those statistics. Um, section, uh, uh, pardon me, recommendation number 30 and recommendation number 38 get to an issue that I think we need to talk about. And they call for an end to the over-representation of Aboriginal people in jail. It's a fact that Aboriginal people are about 3%, 4% of Cairns population, but they make up many times that. In some jails, it's probably 50% of the population is Aboriginal. But there is no plan other than just a command that governments remove this disproportion. Now, either that means we've got a lot of, we have to arrest con and convict and sentence a lot of non-Aboriginal people to prison, or we've just got to let Aboriginal people out of jail. I don't think that the problem is necessarily the custody. It's the crime that led to the custody. By calling for the jails to be emptied, though, what is this Truth and Reconciliation Committee really saying? They're saying put these Aboriginal criminals back into their communities, which are often Indian bands. What they're saying is take the most violent, most dangerous people in the country and put them back amongst women and children on reserve. What do you think that's going to do? If, if there was some command to empty out prisons and put murderers and rapists and other violent people back into your neighborhood, would you call that a victory for whatever race you were? If someone of your own skin color was let out of jail, which is more important to you? that a criminal serve their jail time for a violent offense or that someone with your own skin color is let out. This Truth and Reconciliation Commission believes it's more important to release people out of racial solidarity than to protect the community. It's so ironic uh, because on uh, recommendation 39 and 41, they talk about missing and murdered Aboriginal women. As you know, more than a thousand Aboriginal, have been Aboriginal women have been murdered or are missing in recent years. But they have a very high police solve rate. About 90% of these crimes are solved. And in most cases, 
the murderers were in their own family, either a relative or a boyfriend or a husband. And in most cases, they had a violent relationship with the victim beforehand. This Truth and Reconciliation Commission is calling for more violent criminals to be put back right into the community and then they're wondering about the mystery of why so many Aboriginal women are missing and murdered. It's precisely because there is already an Aboriginal discount in our law. It's called the Gladue discount. If you are Aboriginal, by law, you will get a lower sentence in Canada. Now they're essentially calling for no sentence. That'll make a bunch of lawyers feel pretty noble, but what will life be like on an Indian reserve if all the criminals are let out of jail out of racial solidarity. I understand racial solidarity and racial pride, but emptying out the prisons because of that? Who's going to pay the price for that? Oh, and by the way, it should come as no surprise that Recommendation 32 in this commission is to abolish mandatory minimum sentences. That's got nothing to do with Aboriginal people in particular. It's just more left-wing legal extremism, like the ban on spanking. Did you ever imagine there would be a, a call for an, a, a ban on spanking uh, in an Aboriginal a document? Me neither. Uh, let me speed up, though. There's so much in here. Uh, recommendation 45 is important. It calls upon the country to change its relationships with First Nations. Okay, I agree. I totally agree. We've got to get rid of that Indian Act. We've got to give Aboriginal people the same legal rights and opportunities that the rest of us have. Perhaps that means some sort of a financial payment in, in some historic, uh, some historic um, uh, you know, if, if there was a promise and a treaty to give land or something, pay it out, get them equal. No, no, no. What this calls for is a nation-to-nation relationship. So this Truth and Reconciliation Commission actually says that going forward, we should not treat Aboriginal people as regular Canadians. We should not all be equal before the law. We should not all be citizens together under one government. We should perpetuate and almost constitutionalize a nation-to-nation -nation relationship. Maybe we should have a foreign minister meet their foreign minister. You know, maybe it's just rhetoric and language, but I don't think so. And I don't think that's reconciliation. I think that's entrenchment and perpetuation of racial ghettoization. I don't think that's healthy at all. Are we not all Canadians? Not according to this Truth and Reconciliation Commission. There's other ideas in here that are simply unknown in our law. And, and I say, I come back to the law again because this basically is a document by lawyers for lawyers. Not a lot of concern for ordinary Aboriginals. Uh, section, uh, Recommendation 52, for example, suggests a whole new approach to property rights and suggests that if at any time in history, a century ago, a millennium ago, that an Aboriginal person occupied the land, even just for a day, that legally and constitutionally that should be treated as Aboriginal land from a legal point of view. Well, basically, any land in Canada, therefore, would be owned by, well, by whom? By ordinary Indians? No, no, no. By the Indian bands and the Indian chiefs and the Indian industry and the lawyers. This is not about truth and reconciliation. This is not about coming to terms with the past. This is about conquering the future, racializing the future, litigating the future. And the Chief Justice has signaled she's ready for it. Uh, of course, to keep all this racialization going, to watch over the emptying of the prisons and the lawsuits that will cover every patch of land in the country. Of course, a new bureaucracy will be created called the National Council on Reconciliation with budgets and staffs and lawyers and meetings and conferences. It will be another gorgeous trough. We already have 600 Indian chiefs, the Millionaires Club, of course, that do very well off their tax-free uh, chief salaries. This will just create, what, a, a thousand more Lawyers, a thousand more bureaucrats will get paid. I like uh, recommendation number 58, calling on the Pope himself to come to Canada and offer his apologies to Indian bands for the sins of the Catholic Church in the past. I don't have a lot to say about this. It wouldn't surprise me, frankly, if the Pope did it. But you can't blame the Truth and Reconciliation Commission for aiming low, calling the Pope to come and grovel. I like the chutzpah of it. Uh, there's other strange things in here. I mentioned the ban on spanking is weird. The end of mandatory minimum sentences is weird. But there would be a new statutory holiday 
not about Aboriginal accomplishment or Aboriginal achievement, but about how Aboriginals were mistreated in the past. Sort of a national day of guilt and mourning. That, that doesn't sound like a Truth and Reconciliation Day. That sounds like a Perpetuating Grievances and Victimology Day. Oh, uh, will it surprise you to learn that Section 84 calls for the government to give more money to the CBC? And you thought this was just a Truth and Recon uh, Reconciliation Commission. No, it's a funding CBC commission. Say, do you think the CBC is going to give this report a glowing uh, review? Yeah, I think they will. Uh, I want to read to you recommendation number 86 because I think it shows you the thinking behind here, it's not about Aboriginal people on reserve who have real issues like can they earn a living, can they deal with crime, can they have economic development, can they get a job, those are real issues. Can we deal with social dysfunction, alcoholism, drug abuse, crime? No, 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 this is about lawyers and bureaucrats and it's about wearing the right politically correct ribbon. Let me just read section 86 to you verbatim. We call upon Canadian journalism programs and media schools to require education for all students on the history of Aboriginal peoples, including the history and legacy of residential schools, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Treaties and Aboriginal Rights, Indigenous Law, and I Aboriginal Crown Relations. Now you can say we'd like to teach journalists, we'd like to set up some education, but that's not what they said. They used the word require. This Truth and Reconciliation Commission is demanding that the government, that's who this recommendation is to, it's a government agency, require journalists to be politically educated in the right way. Uh, you know what's going on here? What's going on here is a setup for the future, not a healing of the past. I believe we should heal the past. I believe if there are treaty requirements, we should honor them perhaps with land, perhaps with cash. But it's not a race-based healing, it's a historical healing based on contracts and what we did to particular people. Let me read to you the Commission's idea of what should happen. Not about dealing with issues in the past, land claims, payments, settling grievances and moving on. They want to entrench grievances moving forward. I think of all the things I've read to you, this is the most disturbing. Let me read it. The Commission defines reconciliation as an ongoing process of establishing and maintaining respectful relationships. Okay, that sounds good, but get this. A critical part of this process involves repairing damaged trust by making apologies, providing individual and collective reparations. Pardon me? Now, I understand reparations. If an Aboriginal had something stolen or harmed or suffered some damage, pay them, give them recompense, like any of us would expect if there was a particular atrocity committed, if there was a particular tort committed, as we as lawyers say. Prosecute them, sue them, take them to court. But that's not what this calls for. This is a collective reparation based on your ethnic identity. So Aboriginal people, because of their race, get reparations. And non-Aboriginal people, because of their race, pay reparations. Even if the non-Aboriginals didn't do anything wrong, and even if the Aboriginals didn't, in question, didn't suffer any harm. So, for example, someone immigrates to Canada today from the Philippines or from Somalia or from wherever. By the way, odds are if they're an immigrant, they're a minority themselves. So a new immigrant from the Philippines comes to Canada, starts working, equality before the law, it's one of the things they love about Canada, but no, 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 wait a minute. You have a collective duty to pay reparations. That's what collective reparations means. To pay it to whom? Is there someone out there that, that, was, that was suffered because of this new immigrant from the Philippines? No. And to pay it to maybe, I don't know, a wealthy chief of an Indian band? There are people who had nothing done wrong to them who will get a payoff from people who did nothing wrong based on race. How on earth does that reconcile us as a people? How on earth does that bring us closer together? This is not truly a document of reconciliation. If it was, I would accept it. Even if it had radical ways to reconcile, 
payments, land grants. We could all examine those. Will this put to bed the, the, uh, any grievances? Yes, cut the check. That's not what this is about. This is about making permanent the differences, exacerbating the differences, perpetuating the differences, not to help aboriginals climb up in social development or economic development, but for the profit of lawyers and judges and bureaucrats and those who want another statutory holiday and a ban on spanking. Oh, and there's rules for sports memorials in there too I won't get into. This truth and reconciliation doesn't have a lot of truth in it. It has no reconciliation. It's made a lot of lawyers rich already, and if it's accepted, I think it will perpetuate Canada and make it a racist country that it is now not. For the Rebel.media, I'm Ezra Levant.